I'm gonna let you guys in on a secret. It's not alcoholism if it's in Latin America. Cheers. Oh, this is a good one. Hmm? I'm busting out the good alcohol, not because of the content of the video, but just because of the week that I had. Hi, hello, how's it going? It's low. If you're wondering why do I look dead, that's because I am. Today is Friday the 13th. Not as ominous as the week that we've all collectively had in Brazil, I will say. The point is that the year hasn't even started for two whole weeks and we already had a coup attempt, um, almost like the capital. But imagine if like, instead of just storming the capital, those people were storming also the White House and the Supreme Court at the same time. Imagine that. Did you? Yeah, that's what happened on January 8th back here home. So as a person who works with superior court litigation, <clears throat> I've had a week. And so what's the best way to finish off a shitty week than to talk about a shitty book? So yeah, today we're going to discuss The Night in Its Moon by Piper CJ. That is, if this video stays up for long enough, because some strange things happen when you talk about this book, allegedly. Uh, I'm so dead that I don't even know what the fuck I'm doing. Bandito gostoso, essa tropa tá demais. O que que escolher em qual quero sentar mais? So, last year, as you guys may know, I crashed two cars. <laughs> yeah, I'm still paying for that, by the way. The second car that I crashed, I kind of did something with my back i think it was at the impact it, i don't know I, it was just it hurt to stand for too long so i spent like three or four days laying down um and in that period of time i uh got a little involved with TikTok because i literally had nothing else to do uh and while i was dabbling i was dipping my toes into the murky very murky very weird waters of TikTok. Uh, there was something in it that kept consistently irking me. Except it was not something, it was a someone, and that someone was called Piper CJ. She, in her very piss poor takes on folklore and culture, kept showing all over my uh, timeline. And I was like, God, please stop. No, God, please, no, no! I mentioned to my friends, and I was like, there's this girl who keeps appearing on my For You page. And it's just, just insufferable and I can't fucking stand her. And my friends were like, <laughs> I don't know if you noticed this, but talking about author drama isn't really something that I do on my channel. I love, I love. I'm, I'm a gossip, not in the sense that I want to share information. I just like to retain information. I'm an information hoarder. So it's not necessarily that I want to spread the information around. It's just that I want to have that information. And so I love hearing about tea. Uh, I just am not a person to give it because I don't, I, I can't make it fun. Um, and there's tons of people in the community who already do it and do it very well. And so I don't need to do this. But um, since uh, I've had a year, a, a year, right? If you don't know, I will link the video in the, dis in the links up above. But basically, uh, I had a mental breakdown and I crashed two cars in a month and I lost a lot of money and I got diagnosed as an autistic and also with ADHD. And so it was a lot of stuff. Oh, and I also fell in a manhole. Um, a lot of stuff happened in the span of a year. So I was a little away from the community and the drama. So I was not aware of Piper. And as they say, ignorance is bliss. And I'm not blissed out at the moment. Piper, as I learned, is this author who consistently used to come for reviewers and who came a lot under fire for deliberately invading reviewer spaces um, when she released her uh, debut book, which is The Night in Its Moon. Apparently, this book was written during a manic episode. Uh, if you're wondering, yes, it shows. But it, anyway, it apparently sold well enough that it was getting traditionally published, if I'm not mistaken, by source books. The thing that irked me the most when I was learning about all the situation is that she specifically said that she only takes positive feedback. Being white must be very fun. I don't know what that is. Um, 
but it must be really fun. I will say that. So anyway, the point is, I was like, hmm, how good can a book by a, written by a person who clearly loves to hear themselves talk and who only takes positive feedback be? Uh, and I read it to know, and the answer is that it's not good. Now, Piper has gone to great lengths to discredit people who would do good faith criticism of her book. Uh, things that I've learned that she has done so far, sending an editor after a reviewer, and a reviewer, allegedly, uh, where she, the editor told the reviewer to shut the fuck up, allegedly. Uh, cyber stalking people, allegedly. Uh, all of this is alleged. Alleged accusations. Of course, none of them are real. You can take the book reviewer out of the attorney, but you cannot take the attorney out of the book reviewer. Uh, she also does a lot of this really weird half, um, half truth stuff on her page. And like I, I will say in this review, it feels a lot like whenever I'm listening to Piper talk, I'm being gaslit. Uh, it's this really odd feeling that I get when I talk to some white people every once in a while. And Piper is very white. Culturally speaking, she's very white. Understand of that what you will. So that includes, but is not limited to, some amazing tweets. Like, for instance, uh, wait, let me find it. I just watched The Menu, which was fucking incredible. And when you love something, it's often fun to stay in that world for a little bit longer. Google it. Enjoy it with other fans. And the top hit is always some pretentious critique on, in how it wasn't perfect. I'm so bored of every piece of media receiving some variation of but it manages to fall short or what they failed to accomplish or what they don't quite get is per se to have a superiority complex and be too good to enjoy things. Every movie, TV show, video game, every book has a reactionary slog of people who make their entire personality hating that thing. You're not cooler or better for not liking things. Your refusal to experience joy is exhausting. <laughs> oh, Piper. So this is not a review in good faith. If you consider good faith to be me talking about a book um, and telling the author if the author wants to hear it, what could have been done to improve this book? Uh, what could the author have done to improve their craft, is what I'm saying. This is not gonna be a review like that. No, this is a review of a person without joy. You know why? Because I don't feel joy. I'm Brazilian. I lived four years under Bolsonaro, and when I thought I was finally free, he tried to coo us from Disney World. I am a bitter, little Latin America curmudgeon who actively takes pleasure from hating on things. I am the person who makes hating on things my entire fucking personality. You know why? Because there's a lot of fucking things to hate in this world, Piper. And your book just so happens to be one of them. I am, you may say, where joy goes to die. And for this reason, today, we're gonna talk about all the things that I fucking hated about the night in its moon. Oh yeah, this is the brand of the beer. It's a, uh, I'm not sure if there is some other place in Brazil that has this beer house. If not, this is going to be uh, how people find where I live, but I don't necessarily care because I sue the government on a regular basis. And if you Google my name, you're gonna find a lot of stuff about me on the internet, including, but not limited to, the many fucking times I sue the president. How do you think I kept saying for four years? <laughs> <clears throat> but first, as always, before we do, I, I dig my hateful little fingers into this book. Um, a little bit of housekeeping. I say this very often and people really don't quite understand, but I will repeat it. My social media is not a democracy. There is this strange happenstance that happens to people who happen to talk shit about the night and its moon which is they keep getting flooded with these weird comments of people hating them for the smallest thing from their looks from their appearance saying that elise piper is hot is a very strange phenomenon that tends to happen to people who review the night and its moon um so if you're here to do some of that to be a part of this strange phenomena 
Uh, I will say that my I am very liberal with my block button and also my move button. You can argue with yourself. I will not take harassment. I am already extremely harassed by the government that just ended in my country. So uh, this this is uh, quite literally, actually. Sometimes I get some weird phone calls. Anyway, the point is, if you want to come to me and harass me and defend this book to you die your breath, you're going to get blocked and muted. I am not interested on your defense of Piper. I have my opinions on her uh, as they are very clear so far and I am not interested in having them changed. I just want to be a hateful little bitch, okay? Isn't that what Piper said? That everyone who performs a little bit of criticism on her book is? Yeah, that's what I miss. I'm a hateful little bitch and I like to hate on stuff and I want to hate on her book. That's it. So. With that out of the way, let's get wowed by some truly spectacularly shitty writing, shall we? The only positive of this book, no, there are two, two positives. The first positive of this book is that it was my only moment of escapism and true laughter that I had since uh, January 8th, because I was reading this book and I was like, <laughs> this is so fucking stupid. And for a brief moment, I could forget about the world imploding outside. Um, so that is a point. The second point is that this book is not Silk Fire. It's also not Light Lark. Those are the positives of The Night in Its Moon. If I am to rate The Night in Its Moon on a scale of shittiness from Silk Fire to... Uh, the Night in Its Moon is a solid empire of the vampire. This is not a compliment. I fucking hate Jay Kristoff. Oh my god, you hate so many things. Yeah, like I said, I'm a hateful little bitch. Sue me. And good fucking luck trying to sue me for defamation in Brazil. I'm gonna try to keep it brief, so let's go in order. Here's the synopsis of the book. Farley is just an orphanage. At least that's what the church would have the people believe. But the beautiful orphans know Knox and Faye Touch Damar is no better. There are commodities for sale, available for purchase by the highest bidder. So when the madam of a notorious brothel in a far-off city offers a king's ransom to purchase Amar Amaris, Knox ends up taking her place while Amaris is drawn away to the mountains, home of mysterious assassins. Even as they take up new lives and identities, Nox and Amaris never forget one thing. They will stop at nothing at, to reunite. But the threat of war looms overhead, and the two are inevitably swept into a conflict between human and fey, magic and mundane. With strange new alliances, untested powers, and a bond that neither time nor distance could possibly break, the fate of the realms lies in the hands of two orphans and the love they hold for one another. Now, this review is very misleading because see here where she says that they will stop at nothing to reunite? Basically, this is a book about how perfect Amaris goes off to live her very best life of her dreams and totally forgets about the child best friend that she had. She'll let be sex trafficked in her place. But that's okay. You know why? Because said child best friend is a succubus. So she's a literal sex demon. So she doesn't mind being sex trafficked. It's what she was meant to do anyways. Yeah. So the book follows, as I said, two girls, Amaris and Knox, who live in this orphanage that is almost like a slave market. Um, and Knox literally devotes her entire life to taking care of Amaris. Like, everything that Knox does is to take care of Amaris and to protect Amaris. And Amaris is always described as perfect and white and unmarred by anything and just, you know, just the, the perfection in form of being who is very white. And Knox is described as dark. Oxalá meu pai tem pena de nós tem dó. Uh, this already starts my problems with the book because you see, remember in my Light Lark video when I said that um, Isla, Isla, whatever, Crown was the worst fucking um, main character that I've read? She is, but Amaris is just like this behind. She fucking sucks. That's what I'm trying to say. She's so self-absorbed. She's so selfish. And she she's so self-centered. She doesn't give a shit about any sacrifices that people do for her. And they are consistently doing sacrifices for her. They're consistently sacrificing their beliefs, their bodies, their physical integrity. They're just consistently sacrificing everything for her. And she doesn't give a shit. And this is not one of her flaws. This is the flaw of the writing. 
Because the universe entirely bends to accommodate Amaris. It bends to Amaris every whim. No choice that Amaris takes has consequences to Amaris. Amaris is never punished for anything. And when she is meant to get punished, the woman of color who takes care of her since she was a kid gets whipped in her place. Yeah, the woman of color gets whipped 15% into the book. Just saying, I'm just saying, I'm just saying. And even like when she thinks that she's wrong, it's not that she's wrong, it's that she was right all along. And so people should have trusted her that she's a fucking Mary Sue. That's it. You know why Piper CJ is a better writer than Alex Astor? Because Piper CJ can write a fucking Mary Sue. That's it. That's, that's who Amaris is. The entire universe consistently, all the fucking time, bends to accommodate Amaris and her perfection. Because she's so perfect. She's so beautiful. She's so brave. And she's so determined. And she's so everything all of the fucking time. And that is just so fucking insufferable. Like, even on the moments where she fails, where she's wrong, it comes across this horrible self-pitying, which is like, look, listen to this. It was terribly late by the time she finished in the bath. Her eyelids were weighed by the stones of the world as she forced herself up from her grayish, lukewarm tub, from the silence that she met. From the silence that met the swish of her body against the bathwater, she was confident not even the innkeeper was awake. No one in the building could judge her for her pain. Oh no, this, this part is also, also very good. Um, each barefoot step down the hall echoed two syllables with rhythm consistency. Over and over again, one foot after the other, it repeated alone. Rejection sharp stings showed her a fear worse than death. The dagger within her twisted again as she remembered the hurt, the betrayal, the disgust in her eyes. More than anything, she needed to feel whole again. If you're not understanding what just happened, basically, she is, um, she used her power. She has the power to get people to do what she wants them to do by using her voice. So she commands them and they do what they, what she wants them to do. And she was forbidden from using it. Uh, but then she wasn't because it fit the plot and yada yada blah, whatever. She ends up using it on her brothers in arms, which we're also going to talk about because anyway, they're mad at her and they're mad at her understandably so because she was in a situation where in their eyes, she was dealing with demons and she used this command voice to tell them to step back and leave her alone. And that did not sit well with them. And so, uh, understandably, and so they were mad at her, right? They're mad that this person used that to take away their free will. And she, all that she can think of is not, oh my God, I fucked up. Oh my God, I betrayed their trust. Oh my God, this is like, I, I did something that I was not supposed to do. And there will be consequences for my actions. No, she's like, oh no, I am so alone. I'm in so much pain. I cannot believe that you guys would just leave me alone for a silly little mistake. And then like three pages later, all of the guys who were deeply and rightfully betrayed by her were like, yeah, you know, it's fine. Just don't do it again. What? Like the universe consistently bends to her every whim. And since this is so clearly a self-insert, it's very infuriating because it gives me a glimpse into the life of a human being that I do not want to get a glimpse into the life of. Because if someone walks around thinking that the universe should cater to their every need, that is a person I do not want close. I do not want to know a single thing about this person. Everything that I learned about this person has been against my will. But there are two sides here. And the other side is Knox. And oh, <sighs> let's talk about Knox. Shall we? Knox is Amaris' best friend in the orphanage. And she was chosen by the nuns who ran the orphanage. I think there were nuns. I honestly cannot recall. I think there were nuns, matrons, whatever. And they told Knox, who were like, was like two. Hey, take care of this one-year-old baby. Because... 
why the fuck not? She spends her entire childhood protecting this perfect little human being. And here's the thing, it doesn't matter how Piper wants to spin this, um, Knox is not a white woman. Let me, let me read to you guys how she is described in a scene. The young woman clasped her delicate bronze hands in front of her. Apart from himself and Samuel, he hadn't seen many people with her particular coloration. The lovely tan skin would have made her stand out in the tavern by itself, but the woman was a testament to the goddess eye for beauty, as she was a masterpiece. Her glossy black hair shone like wet ink, her white purely teeth flashed with a natural allure in an effortless winsome, winsome smile. And then she goes on to describe her breasts. Anyway, that's not the important part. What's the important part is that this is very clearly not a white woman. And so there is this woman of color who forgoes any type of childhood to take care of this perfect unmarred, which is repeated time and time again, this perfect unmarred white character. Are we seeing the issues? Are we seeing the trouble? Are we? Let me make it worse. She takes care of Amaris by literally bearing the brunt of every single bad decision Amaris makes. It's like to restore balance in the world, whatever shitty decision Amaris takes that gives no consequence to her, all the consequence goes to Nox, who basically doesn't do anything wrong. It's just like she keeps getting fucked over for no fucking reason. And to get fucked over, please know that I mean, A, she gets whipped instead of the white character. The woman of color gets whipped instead of the white character. Yes, that's a thing that happens in this book too. She gets sold into sex trafficking instead of the white perfect unmarred character. Yes, this is also a thing that happens in this book. She becomes a prostitute. She gets raped and she nearly gets killed by a serial killer. Most of these things, like all of these things shouldn't have happened to anyone, um, let alone all of them in the same character, okay? There are two types of Mary Sue that I, I can identify. And I think TV Tropes has a thing about this. The Mary Sue where everything is perfect and the world accommodates to her every whim. And the Mary Sue where everything is awful and everything goes wrong and just like everything happened, all the bad things happen to, to the main character because this is how authors who can't write try to understand flaws. Um, they don't. And so that's what they write instead. And I feel like both Amaris and Knox are two types of Mary Sues. And when I say Mary Sue, what I mean is characters that are not developed, that are not whole, that are not fleshed out. They are just hollow interpretations of something that the author wanted to put on page. She wanted a perfect character and she made that perfect character white and unmarred without realizing that we are not writing books outside of the world and that has a very strong way to it which should not have been left aside. And she writes a woman of color character where every bad thing that this woman could have possibly thought of was going to be put to happen to this character. But don't you dare say anything negative about this woman or her book, because then she'll get sp upsetty spaghetti. And then all of the nerds who follow her on TikTok will also get upsetty spaghetti. And they'll come to your comments and say that you're fat. As creative as the night in its moon, I will say. So the question is, why would you do this? Why would you make this woman of color character who consistently gets fucked over, who gets put through harrowing experiences for no reason other than shock value because this author cannot write a compelling plot to save their lives? Why would you do this? And then it clicked. Then it clicked. Then it was like an aha moment in my head because you see, you see, uh, the night in its moon, is not just a bad book. The Night in Its Moon is a bad copy of The Witcher. Yes, I know, I know that Piper doesn't want people talking about this, but I have to talk about this because if I come to you and I say, girl with white hair and a face scar gets saved by a man who is a part of an old um, organization of trained monster killers who live up in the mountains um, and who use potions and do trials to become one of this organization, 
uh, this girl has a voice power and the she's the only woman, the first woman to train with this assassins for ages because they feared that she would not survive this necessary steps to become one of them. What would you say that that is? Exactly, that's the night in its moon. If you say The Witcher, that's because this book is a blatant fucking copy of it. Piper had the gall of saying, oh, the similarities are just because I'm, in, I'm influenced by Slavic folklore. Bitch, are you... Listen, Slavic folklore is Vasilisa the Beautiful. It's uh, Tsernobog. It's fucking Akikimora. If you wanted to talk about Slavic folklore, you could have talked about Akikimora. Like, that is more of a reference to Slavic folklore than the exact plot of The Witcher is. Because as far as I'm concerned, and as far as, far as I'm aware, and I looked into this, the plot of The Witcher is not any folk tale that I could identify. The plot of The Witcher belongs to Indra Sapowski. So, no, this is not Slavic folklore. You want to read Slavic folklore? Read The Bear and the Nightingale, written by a person who has an actual degree in Russian history and who writes these stories with passion and with a lot of knowledge of what she's talking about because i don't think that piper has all that knowledge on what she's saying that she has she likes to make tiktoks waving her diploma i would wave mine but mine is like up up and i really don't want to get up to get it but i have two i have a degree in law and I have a master's degree in law and I'm currently pursuing a PhD in law so one day I'll do like a fan thing with my uh but fear not I have a picture this one right here it's a good picture but the the what really irks me as you all know I'm a huge fan of the witcher I love the witcher I've read the books play the games watch the series I I love the witcher and one thing that really fucking annoys me is that this is not only a bad copy of The Witcher, it's a bad copy because it's very, it's, it deeply misunderstands the source material. So this is a bad Witcher fanfic. The Witcher is not the story of the Chosen One. The point of The Witcher is not the story of the Chosen One. The Witcher is a story about morality, is a story of Geralt, who happens to be the father of the Chosen One, both of which are very unhappy with this predicament. But Geralt goes around in the world and he has to make these really difficult moral choices. He's like an amateur philosopher. He, I know that the Witcher series puts Geralt as this brooding type of guy going like, hmm, but he's a truly an amateur philosopher. He is consistently put into situations of moral dilemmas. So this is the story of Geralt, who happens to be the father of the Chosen One, and who wants the Chosen One to succeed and doesn't want the Chosen One to become what he is, because he's aware of all the pain that he went through in order to become a witcher. When Piper CJ writes the Reavers, who are assassins, living in the mountains, trained to hunt uh, 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 monsters, what do you think that is? Those are the witchers. That is the, the organization, the School of the Wolf, Kaer Morin. All of the elements that make up what we would know as the Witcher are there. And so, um, but here's the thing, because what she's doing is she's taking the outwards layer of the Witcher, but she's not going deep into what makes the Witcher great. What makes the Witcher great is not the fight, is not the, it's the moral conflicts that exist at the heart of the Witcher, which is why when you play Witcher 3, Wild Hunt, you have so many shitty and difficult choices to make because Wild Hunt completely gets the books. It gets that sometimes you're going to have to make choices that you hate because of the lesser evil. Is the thing about the lesser evil. What is the greatest? What is the lesser? What is the middling? The beginning of Geralt's journey is a journey where he says there is no lesser evil. I can't choose because he's so jarred by everything that he lived in his life. But towards the book and towards the, the game, Geralt comes to understand that there is no such thing as a lesser evil and he has to make a choice. Otherwise, a choice is going to be made for him. And if that is the magic of the Witcher games, in my opinion, because it doesn't coddle you. We're going to get to that in a second. I just want to say that when Piper writes about Amaris, this girl who is fey touched and she is completely very white, very pale, with very white hair, with a scar on her face, who goes to, who gets you know, this father-daughter relationship with this reaver called Aldrin, which, by the way, what a fucking 
ridiculous name Aldrin is. I will have to, what a fucking ridiculous name Aldrin is. Holy shit. Anyway, she gets in this father-daughter relationship with Aldrin and she goes to this place to train where there are other, uh, the where they, they train this organization called the Reavers. And the Reavers are this, you know, all of that just comes to explain to me that this is a bad copy and this was directly influenced and directly plucked from the Witcher, the series, the Witcher, the universe. But what makes me even more angry is that this book is not only a deliberate misinterpretation of the Witcher, this book is a deliberate misinterpretation of my favorite character in their entire world, which is Yennefer of Engerberg. Yennefer is an amazing and deep character who is an outlier in fantasy because Yennefer, and especially when it's male written fantasy, women in male written fantasies usually have to choose between um, love and a family or power. And Yennefer refuses to choose. She's like, I want the two. And she gets it. She gets the two. She gets the himbo and she gets the power. She's respected and she has a daughter. And that is what she wanted. That is what she wanted to be complete in that sense. And it's very rare that in male written fantasy that is something that can happen. One of the things that I love the most about Yennefer is that she's a character that people consistently say is difficult to love. She's a woman who is difficult to love because she is a difficult person. She's difficult to handle. But at the same time, she gets love. She is deserving of love. She is deserving of affection. She's deserving of all of that. And so I feel like she's such an amazing character because it's so rare that we can see in fantasy characters who are so deep and so complex and so layer who are women. The Yennefer is just a complete outlier and I absolutely love Yennefer. So what is, what is, makes me very angry with the Night in its Moon is that Amaris is very clearly supposed to be Ciri. Odrin is very clearly supposed to be Geralt. Um, and Knox is very clearly supposed to be Yennefer. Don't trust me? Here's the Pinterest page that Piper CJ had to Amaris. There was also this TikTok, I think she deleted it, but it was art she commissioned of Knox and it looked just like Yennefer from Wild Hunt. Even the description that she gives is very much like Yennefer from the Witcher series, like Anya Chalotra. And it's just so fuck like, much like Empire of the Vampire, it's this weird copy of the Wild Hunt. Like I said in my Witcher video, I have issues with Indra Sapowski's writing and the way that Indra Sapowski's writing works. But one thing that I do love is how he creates a world that you can get lost in and how he creates characters who are so incredible because they are so lovingly carved. They are characters who are very deeply flawed but have many redeeming qualities and who clash with one another all the time. They're, the, the things that they want out of one another are consistently put it to odds at all times. All of these characters have goals and have flaws and they get fucked over and over again because of their own choices. Because every choice opens a consequence and the universe of the, of the Witcher is not unwieldy. It's a universe where if you make a wrong choice, then you're going to get your ass handed to you. And that happens to the characters over and over again. This is how Siri gets her scar. It's not an act of defiance. It's not a beautiful moment of defiance. Siri gets that scar at the lowest point of her life because of the choices that she made that got her into that place, but also because of the things that just happened to her, the evil that just happened to her and she had no control over. But the Night in its Moon, even if we assume that the Night in its Moon, despite the obvious, was not influenced by the Witcher. Why is the Witcher better than the Night in its Moon? Because despite both being Slavic-ish inspired, and I say ish because there is a reference to Yggdrasil um, in the book, which as we all know is North mythology. So it's a little mishmash of different Eastern European and Northern European and European mythos coming from a person who says they have a folklore degree. So. The reason why The Witcher is better than The Night in Its Moon is because it's able to create a world that is unwielding and characters that are interesting to be seen trying to bend the rules of the world and failing. So it's a world that is incredibly interesting in its inception 
but also characters who you are invested in. And The Night in Its Moon falls very short of The Witcher in the nuance and the detail. Because, again, even if she was just inspired by it, she fundamentally misunderstands the source material of The Witcher. She just thinks The Witcher is cool. And so, do you, like, there is a point in The Witcher Wild Hunt where you have to choose between killing a victim of domestic violence and children. Like, their lives are in your hands and you have to make a choice. There is no other way. And so those moments are what makes The Witcher The Witcher. That depth, the moral complexities of the choices that you have to make, the moral complexities of the choices that the characters are forced to make. All of that, the world that is unyielding, the world that hands out consequence to the acts. There is no person in this world that is too perfect. There is no person in The Witcher that is too too perfect. She took Yennefer's beauty as if it was just a given. But the fact is that Yennefer's beauty is also a weapon, is also a source of pain to Yennefer. That is the point that we meet Yennefer in the books. That is the point that we meet Yennefer in the series. It's almost like Piper took the beats of The Witcher, but she forgot to take the melody. It's like... The story is the same but lacks the soul of The Witcher. And even if you say that the story is not the same, which again, it's not the case because even if you just took the snapshot of the community of assassins, of months, of monster killers living high up in the mountains who take specific trials in order to become what they are, that in itself is already the plot of The Witcher. And there is no other way around it. But what I'm saying is that even if we, we assume that this book was not, this book tries to do what The Witcher did and fails miserably because it fails to gather the soul of what The Witcher is. The Witcher is about the consequences of your own actions, the consequences of your own choices. And this book hands out consequences only for one character while keeping the other one afloat. And so she has gone on TikTok to say that she was not influenced by this book at all. Like, bitch, do you come into my house? You lie to my face? Like I said, it's just like being consistently gaslit by someone. It's awful. I hate hearing her speak. Because it's like it's like I'm being gaslighted all the time. It's like what I'm seeing with my two eyeballs is not what I'm actually seeing. Especially like since the point that she plucked from The Witcher, especially from Witcher Wild Hunt, was Yennefer's obsession with Ciri. Now, here's something I asked a friend of mine who just so happens to be a mom. I don't have my glasses on, this is going to be complicated. If I told you one of your kids went missing and there was a likelihood someone very dangerous was after them, the person who has harmed your kid before and you couldn't stop it, what would you do to get them back? And then she answered, um, I would ruin lives, burn shit to the ground. There's nothing I would, wouldn't do for my kids. I do unspeakable shit, to be honest. So I asked my mom the same question and she also answered something on the like because, and here's the thing that Piper fundamentally misunderstands, Yennefer is Ciri's mother and Ciri herself admits it so in the book and Yennefer herself admits it so in the book because her obsession in the wild hunt to find Ciri is not born out of romantic love, is a mother's preoccupation of a child. The reason why she's so obsessed and she's so headstrong and she's so rude, it's because she is a mother looking for her kid. She knows her kid is in danger. She knows her kid is going to get fucked up if the wild hunt finds her. She is desperate after her kid. And the lack of reciprocity from Siri makes sense because she knows that Yennefer has been hurt by the wild hunt before. She doesn't want that to happen again. And she's preoccupied in running for her fucking life. So... Those two things together makes for a dynamic where Siri doesn't really remember Yennefer most of the time because she has other things or other more pressing issues going on. And Yennefer is completely and utterly obsessed with finding Siri because Siri is her daughter and she doesn't know where her daughter is. She doesn't, she knows that people are after her who want to hurt her and she just wants, like, she, she, she can't. Like, she will do anything. She will do unspeakable things. And this is the difference between Triss and Yennefer, which this book even has a Triss. She's called Yemli. And when I realized what her character arc was going to be, I screamed in complete rage. 
Anyway, I digress, but this is a difference between Triss and Yennefer because Triss has some moral boundaries that she will not cross even if that meant finding Ciri and Yennefer has none. She will do stuff that is morally and objectively wrong just to make sure that um, that Ciri is going to be found well and is going to be found, found alive. So that is the root of the obsession. If you take away the mother-daughter relationship, that obsession makes no sense. Because objectively speaking, Amaris was kind of shitty to Knox all her life. She, like she didn't recognize or be or was grateful or literally did anything for Knox really uh, in the time that the two of them were together in the orphanage. And so why is the reason that Knox is so obsessed with this girl? Are they soulmates? Like what is the fucking purpose? What is the point? Because Knox did not have, or at least the book fails to show, um, any sort of cohesive motive for Knox to be as obsessed as she is with finding Amaris. It's just, it makes no sense. Like, Knox is desperate to find this girl, and Amaris is like, whoa, 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 whoa. new phone, who's this? Amaris goes off to live her best life as a witcher, I mean, as a reaver. And Knox just keeps getting handed the worst fucking hand that people has have ever imagined like it's just shitty stuff after shitty stuff after shitty stuff it's just so fucking awful what Knox goes through she just spends year after year getting raped and being mistreated and being exploited and being it's just so disgusting what happens to Knox and she never resents Amaris she never once doubts Amaris's love for her, which I doubt that a lot because I have absolutely no idea if Amaris even thinks of Nox every once in a while. I know that she thought of Nox every once in a while, but it was just like, it was so random and so out of place that it was just like, bro, this girl is just like, she doesn't give a shit about Nox. And Nox is completely obsessed about finding her. It's so weird. This book truly is a study in self-absorption because the characters are not characters. Aside from Anaris, Amaris and Nox, every single character exists to feel a purpose in the main characters' lives, to bend to their whims or to cause them irrevocable, irrevocable harm. And even the moments where she tries to give the story some background, she tries to give those characters some background, it doesn't change the fact that they serve no purpose but to cater to these characters every whim. It, it's weird because it, it Piper in this book she can't imagine and she can't write true friendships. Like she wants to imagine that she does and she wants to say that she does that what Amari shared with other witchers was friendship but it really isn't. It's like you keep people close who might be useful to you and you think you like them but you truly are ready to ditch them the sooner the moment where they're no longer useful for you and this is what amaris does she ditches people all the time who are no longer useful for her and we're not even discussing the hideous treatment of sex workers in this because here's the thing sex work and sex trafficking are not the same fucking thing sex workers deserve all of our respect and but all sex workers in this book, the feeling that I got is that they all feel like they were tainted by sex work. Almost like sex work made them worse people somehow. Which is so fu- Why would you write something like that? Why would you- Uh-huh. No one is irre irrevocably changed for doing sex work. No, it's, no one is tainted. No one is tarnished for doing sex work. That is not something that happens. Sex work is work. Um, and so- I, it, it's not the same thing as sex trafficking, and if you are sex trafficked like Knox was, that also does not tarnish you. It does not mark you as a hideous human being, but it's all good and fun because fucking Knox is a succubus. So she likes sex to begin with, so it's not that much of a big deal that she was fucking sex trafficked in place of the white character. I can't with this book. I fucking can't with this book. It's, it's so fucking, I can't. I'm gonna, this is going to be the first fucking time that I'm gonna end a beer.
all talking shit about a book and I need to take out the trash. Like there was absolutely no, I'm gonna hammer this point again because there was absolutely no fucking reason for Knox to go through the experiences that she goes through as a woman of color suffering for the sake of suffering. It's exhausting to read and all of this for a Yennefer Siri incest fic that fundamentally misunderstands the bond that the two have. But not only, this book commits one of the major sins in in uh books for me which is telling me what to think this book is so preoccupied with making you love amaris as much as the author does that it fails to accomplish actual characters that people might grow to love and this is the only thing that i'll say about piper the author um piper the author like many tiktok authors and i think that this is something that i've seen in tiktok books and authors who mainly do their marketing on tiktok mostly um, they are extremely preoccupied in controlling the narrative. People have to say what they want to hear all the time at every turn. And here's the thing. Um, I'm not saying that she's doing anything, but I was talking to some people uh, on both TikTok and BookTube. And you wouldn't believe the strange things that I heard because strange happenstances happen to you, you see when you decide to talk shit about the night in its moon. Every time someone posts a video talking less than stellar things about the night in its moon, the video suddenly gets flagged and demonetized. Someone posts a TikTok about the night in its moon saying that it's trash, it suddenly gets mass reported. TikTok accounts lost because of mass reporting as well. And oddly coinciding with the time that someone said something less than flattering about Piper or the book. And I can't say that um, I can follow the dots and connect all of the dots, but my lord, how many dots there are. So this is a book like Wicked Saints or Empire of the Vampire who doesn't trust the reader to create their own opinion about the book. It wants to tell you what to think about the character, the world, the universe, about everything. What Piper doesn't quite get, and I think that all TikTok authors don't quite get, is that you don't get to control the narrative when you put a book out. Once you put a book out, it's out. And people will have opinions about that book. The book doesn't get to tell me what I should think about it. The author doesn't get to tell me what I should think about the book. This book for me is a rough first draft. The characters lack motivation. Uh, the universe needs to be more solid. It needs to be more unwielding. Um, the th white equals pure and imperfect and unmarred and dark equals tainted sex worker thing just has got to go. Because the implications of this, especially talking as a Latina woman, are horrid. We Latinas suffer so much with hypersexualization of our bodies to the point where we're sexually harassed. Um, just a lot of things have happened to me personally and to other Latina women that I know because we are so hypersexualized. And to write a woman of color character who is what hypersexualized and from that hypersexualization comes just a bunch of really bad shit, but it's fine because she likes it. It's so fucking demeaning to write. That is actively harmful. The portrayal of Knox in this book is actively harmful because it makes light of hypersexualization as a problem that we face, as a terrible burden that we carry. Because being hypersexualized all the fucking time makes you feel less than human. And this was a nuance that was lacking in the portrayal of Knox. She was a sex worker who absolutely loathes what she does and hates herself for doing it and feels tainted for doing it, but she was built to do it. So it's almost like it's she should, should, should just take it. This is so fucking insulting to read as a Latina woman. It's like we have been dying in troves from femicide all across Latin America. And to say that the destiny that we face is one that we should accept because we were built for it? Excuse me? Like, no one fucking told her that this was not going to be well received. No one said to her that having a character of color be whipped and sex trafficked instead of the white character to protect and save the white character was gonna get read for shit. Because you guess what? She only takes positive feedback. And so she is not allowing herself the space to grow because she thinks that people who hate everything lack joy. Yeah, I lack joy for being consistently threatened with femicide. If you were, I bet that you would lack joy too, Piper. Anyways, if this video gets reported and demonetized out of fucking nowhere, I think you guys know, have enough crumbs to follow the path 
through the woods to know what happened to my video, right? Right. Um, but if that happens, you can always buy me a coffee on my Ko-fi or join me on Patreon, um, where you can vote what shitty book I'm going to read next month, which next month is going to be Colleen Hoover themed. God help me. Um, I would also like to add that I am open for commissions. If you want me to re read a book, be it as a reviewer, a beta reader, or a sensitivity reader, you can find all of my information on my Kofi below. Anyway, yeah, The Night in Its Moon sucks. Um, uh, apparently the sequel comes out in like a month. I'm not gonna read it. I suggest that you don't either. This book is not only badly written, but is actively harmful against women of color. And I would suggest that we just collectively let her dreams wither and die. Much like my joy on the 13th of Feb of January of this year. I don't even know. Like, this week lasted for so long. It, like, one week lasted for five whole months. It was insane. A lot of things have happened. I can make a video talking about it, but it's just, like, a lot of insanity has happened. Anyway, I'm out of beer. And um, I am tired to talk about a book where a woman of color is raped for absolutely no fucking reason. So I am done and I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.